Hi everyone, welcome to the 10th episode of the ongoing series here on Sfarim Chatter, Spanish Jewry Through the Ages. On this episode of the series, uh, I was joined by Professor Richard Kagan, uh, who is uh, an expert on uh, Spanish Jewry and the Inquisition, and we discussed um, mainly a volume that he edited, and some stories from there about inquis- inquisitorial inquiries, and some uh, autobiographies and kind of stories, personal stories of that came about through the Inquisition. So naturally, we got into uh, discussing the Inquisition itself and some more of what you heard last week from Professor Luan Hamza. So going, you know, that was more of an overview on the Inquisition. This episode and the following few weeks will be different scholars takes take, you know, each one of their specific kind of take on the Inquisition, but it's going to be more, so you'll hear some overlapping, some differences of opinion, and then some more specifics. There, this week will be on... Um, some random, you know, various Inquisition stories. They'll be on uh, just on following weeks. There'll be one on the uh, woman, female conversos of uh, Castile. They'll also be on the uh, town of Guad- Guadalupe. Guadalupe. You'll hear that in a couple of weeks, and there'll be on some other some other ones as well before getting to the expulsion uh, of 1492, and then the kind of forced conversion slash expulsion of Portugal in 1497-98. And then beyond that as well, there'll be the South American Inquisition, Lima, uh, as well as um, the kind of a little bit about the Spanish Portuguese. We're not going to go, the series is not, that, that that's really its own series, but we will be discussing that because that's kind of Converso, New Christian, Murano, et cetera. And then, you know, kind of in the new world, uh, as well as Amsterdam and Hamburg and London, et cetera, all over. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll discuss that a little bit uh, on the series before going on to uh, more things. There's still a lot of episodes uh, to come, but um, now we're really in the Inquisition part, and so uh, that's what this episode with Professor Kagan is about. I, you know, I said this on the Sunday non-Spanish series show in the intro, and I'll say it here again. I am taking guest suggestions. I'm not sure how many more I'm going to be recording for the Spain series, but if there's something missing. Um, with the Inquisition, there will be a few more Inquisition episodes. So, you know, maybe you, you won't have heard it. But if if it's if you just listening to these two, you say, okay, you know, you should really be discussing this, and you have a guest suggestion. You know, maybe I will get to it. Perhaps I, I you know, I'm not really recording more in the series, but it, it definitely is a possibility. So, email me farmchatter at gmail dot com if you have any suggestions. I would like to thank the corporate sponsor of the series, as always, very uh, much appreciate them, uh, which is Glock Plumbing. So for all your service needs, big or small in New Jersey, with a full service division from boiler changeouts, main sewer line snakeouts, camera in main lines, to a simple faucet leak, Glock Plumbing Service Division has you covered. Give them a call, 732-523-1836, extension 1. Again, 732-523-1836, extension 1. And if you call them, uh, which if you're in New Jersey and you have a plumbing issue, you should, uh, tell them that you heard it on the Farm Chatter podcast. Uh, you can also email me, you know, to, to see if uh, the advertising works. You can uh, let me know if you ended up uh, using them. Um, also, if you can uh, un- subscribe where you listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 24-6, etc. And if you can rate the podcast as well, very much appreciate it on Apple, Apple Podcasts, as well as if anyone is interested in sponsoring an episode um, or just supporting the podcast, there's a link in the show's notes via, pay- via PayPal, Zelle, Chase QuickPay. And so on. And uh, with that, enjoy the 10th episode of the series in Spanish Jury. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Sfarim Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Richard Kagan, who is the Arthur O. Lovejoy Professor Emeritus of History and Academy uh, Professor of History at, at Johns Hopkins University. If I got that all correct. And we're yes, you did. Be, okay, great. And we, we're, we're going to be discussing. Um, the Inquisition, and especially um, the kind of autobiographies, if you will, of various uh, people tried by the Inquisition. Uh, Professor Kagan edited uh, volume two editions, the first edition, the second edition of editions with Abigail Dyer, uh, titled Inquisitorial Inquiries, Brief Brief Lives of Secret Jews and Other Heretics by Johns Hopkins University Press. That was published it. And we'll be discussing some of those uh, autobiographies and stories of the people involved and just in general, the various stories about the uh, those involved with the Inquisition. So thank you, Professor Kagan, for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you. Let's, let's sort of, if you can tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay. Um, 
I, I, I'm a historian. I taught for many, many years at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore until my retirement there in 2013. And, uh, and, and I've been living in Philadelphia ever since. Um, uh, I became interested in the history of Spain during the, in, my, in my high school years because I learned Spanish. My father wanted me to go into business, and uh, he said, well, Spanish would be a good, good opportunity, so you can go to Latin America and Spanish America, but little did he know that by the time I got to university, uh, I didn't have so much interest in following his footsteps in, in, in business, and, and that language, uh, Spain got me into history, and I was the only student in the class who knew Spanish. My professor assigned me a topic, and the next thing I knew, I was going to graduate school in Cambridge in England to study with the, the then the world's preeminent historian of, of, of the history of Spain, uh, John Eliot, uh, who sadly died last year. And uh, I started writing about Spain in the 16th and 17th century. And in, initially, I didn't write about the Inquisition, although you can't avoid it. It's there, like the, <laughs> it's right there in the room. I wrote about universities, and then I wrote another book about lawyers and litigation. And then I got involved. I kind of had a little in the 19, early 1980s. I got became interested in in El, the the work of El Greco, and thanks to the National Gallery of Art, I got involved in that. That is in Washington. I got involved in a cat, the writing of a, a catalog essays on on El Greco, and to learn more about the world of El Greco in Toledo, I started reading. Inquisition, Inquisition records. I wanted to reconstruct the, uh, let's say the uh, that's in the 16th century, the the spiritual ambiance of that city in the middle of Spain. And all lo and behold, I started reading these records, and they're very interesting. And I came across the, uh, the, the, the uh, what I really got in. I came across this um, woman by the name of Lucretia de Leon. I wrote a book on Lucretia's dreams using inquisitorial sources. And that was what got me involved into in learning more about the Inquisition and how it functioned. So in a sense, I've been doing the Inquisition one way or another for the last uh, over 40 years. And actually, I've just finished a biography of the first U.S. historian to write seriously about the Inquisition. His name is uh, Henry Charles Lee, who lived here in Philadelphia and whose sources are, whose records are here at, at the University of Pennsylvania Library. So uh, the... I, I, I hate to say it, I, I, I've been going to sleep with the Inquisition for you, <laughs> the last, seriously, the last few years, and 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 enjoying and getting involved in reading the records, and that's that was the genesis of partly the genesis of the book that you mentioned. So let me ask you just as a general question. I've had this this other guests in the series. I've asked them this. Who you know, many people, many historians that use Inquisition documents. And I know this was once a question of back and forth. How do you use the Inquisition documents, especially like these kind of autobiographies, as we'll be discussing, uh, and then just all Inquisition documents in general? What What is your, I mean, opinion, obviously you use them, but how does one go about using these Inquisition documents and how not how trustworthy they are, but how, how, how accurate are they, so to speak? Well, I mean, okay, let's back up a little bit. I, uh, um, that's a lot of questions there. First one is I got involved. I want what when I started writing about this woman, Lucretia de Leon, who had a huge case, thousands and thousands of pages. She was a prophetess who, who got into trouble because she prophesied the, the the destruction of the Spanish Armada, among other things, and the king didn't like that and had her, and had her arrested. You you start reading, you get into these records, and I realized then that most of the people who had studied the Inquisition, did it from an institutional perspective, or they did it from a sociological perspective. They were counting the cases and then whether the ups and downs and the kind of categories of people, whether the people were, were, there, were they just conversos, were they bigamists or guilties of other crimes, were they Protestants and so on and so forth. And that was the kind of the dominant way of looking at the Inquisition in the, in, in the 1980s. And I, because of my own particular predilections and friendships at, at Hopkins, I wanted a more, a more anthropological, a more personal approach. And I said, well, here the, you, at the beginning of each of these inquisit inquisitorial trials, they asked the, the person who's been arrested, the first question is somewhat alarming. They said, why have you been arrested? And, and the person, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> well, and, and starts searching their minds. And then one of the next questions is, well, tell us more about yourself. 
and I can get more into how that happened. But it, it was the next things they they asked for. Well, tell us the, the story of your life. Now, why does the Inquisition ask about the story of their life? Because in the 16th century, they they think that heresy, much like hair color, or stature, or, or eye color, was it could be inherited. And so they want to know as much about that person as they possibly can. And and the people started, they, they asked you, first they would name your mother, name your father, what prayers do you know, what books have you read? And then they often say, tell us more about your lives. And it was that, those kind of, I call them inquisitorial autobiographies, uh, that I said, boy, that would make a really interesting way for students to learn about the Inquisition in a first-person way rather than to have it mediated through kind, some kind of historian. And that was the genesis of the book that you mentioned, Inquisitor, uh, the, uh, Inquisitorial Inquiries, The Brief Lives of, uh, of, uh, of Secret Jews and Other Heretics. And the book was arranged so that students could get to read these, read these stories. And I, I, and, and I really, with the help of Abby, who was a, then a graduate student at the University of Colorado, uh, I, I constructed in a way that the, the those stories would become, I wouldn't tell them a lot about the stories before that each chapter. I wanted the students to read about it and then read about what I thought afterwards. I wanted them to talk. In fact, is when I taught, I was teaching the history of the Inquisition. And I often said, just read the stories. Don't read what I said. I want your reactions. And that was, and that's how I got into it. Now, so that's the question is I wanted to personalize the Inquisition make it a, 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 a vivid source. And those stories are quite vivid in many cases. Now, you ask another question, are they reliable? Are these autobiographies? So the document is the document. And every single person who's arrested by the Inquisition is that, that, that those proceedings, those oral proceedings are transcribed by a notary who is sitting in the room. And whether, it, whether it's just question and answer but on those occasions, they may be led to a torture chamber. It's all written down. And that's from the start of the Inquisition in 1478, the Spanish Inquisition, that is, until its, its final extinction in the 1830s. Those records are reliable. It, it tells you what took place in the, in the courtroom, in the Inquisitional, they call it the audience, or the hearing. Now, is what does what the individuals say totally truthful? Are these stories about themselves totally truthful? Well, let's jump back again a second. Uh, we, we've read, you, you and I have read autobiographies. In theory, they're truth-telling, but they're also constructive. Think, think of anyone you've read from starting with Rousseau in, 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 the, in, in the 18th century to some politician. I can't think of one right now. Paul, Think of Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. They, they all have some autobiography that they write. It's a constructed document for a particular end. It's, this is not to say there's not elements of truth in it, but there's emphases and blanks and the like. And the same is true of these inquisitorial autobiographies. They're not 100% truthful because they're constructed. So that person, one way or another, is saying, Look, wait, they ask you, why are you here? Probably knows to a certain degree why they've been arrested. So they either try to fake it, de-emphasize certain parts of their lives, obscure certain parts of their lives, re-emphasize others. But, they, but once, that's, once the machinery gets going, then they're open to questions and answers on the part of the judges. And then they say, well, clarify this. Well, clarify that because the aim of an inquisitorial trial, unlike cr criminal trials, or, or we know in, 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 in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, it's not to prove the innocence or guilt of the individual. By the time the person shows up for trial, it's called the trial of faith. They, the, inquis the inquisitors themselves have, have listened to, to and gathered testimony, written testimony, from a variety of witnesses who have come forward to denounce that person. And they have, so they know, they, they, they've made a judgment. In some cases, that those that witness testimony is dismissed. They said, well, there's not enough here. Forget about it. 
that person is not arrested. But if they feel that they have enough information or suspicion of, of heresy, then, the per, then they can order that individual's arrest. They bring them to the inquisitorial courts, put them in prison for the first day, then bring them out. And then the trial of faith begun, begins. And they begin always, why have you been arrested? And, and, and then the, the rest of it, the rest follows. So in a sense, they're not distort, the, the scribe there is not distorting the record. You and I are talking in the first person. But if you're writing this down, they said, she said, he said. They don't, don't do it in the first person. And so there's, there's, there's a sense of a, a slight distortion of the text. It's not a first person narrative you're reading. You're reading as if it's taking place as a story. So you, get, you, get, you have to back that up a little bit. So, but that's how it is. And, and so they're, but they're not necessarily putting words in the mouth of these people. And in fact, recent studies have shown that these, they're quite remarkable how these scribes can even, in some, in some of these cases, they, they, they don't, they're not changing the language per se. They're actually using quotidian speech, slang and the like. It enters into the text that would be, we, we can interpret as oral expression rather than this more learned person's uh, uh, rephrasing of, of grammatical errors that might take place when you're talking under duress in front of some judges and you're trying to save your life or, or, or get a lesser, get a lesser pen, sentence than or, or somehow mitigate your guilt in one way or another. Does that make? Does that answer that question to a certain degree? It's a long-winded answer. Sorry about that. No, I, th I think it does answer. I think the only other slight point about that is torture. And this has come up that torture is not as prevalent. I mean, you could, maybe you can speak about it. how prevalent was torture and how does torture factor into this? Well, I, there's always the, the most cases never proceed to torture. And it's exaggerated. First of all, you have to remember that in early in 16th, 17th, 18th century courts, torture for criminal trials was commonplace, whether you're in England or France or Italy or Germany. It's and and, and it's an extreme measure of extracting truth, or what they believe factual truth from, from a defendant. The Inquisition does not uh, uh, use torture, not as much in some cases in criminal trials. And their methods are sometimes horrible as they are, and they were horrible. Water tortures, like in Guantanamo, or stretching you or the like. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's gruesome. But they it generally not applied in cases unless they believe the person, unless the judges think the person is really lying or there's more to tell. Because here you have to remember that the aim of this whole trial of faith is to ext extract a confession on the part of the, this call the, we call it the defendant, somebody the defendant, call it the victim, the person who has been arrested. The, the, they, the inquisitors have a suspicion that person is already guilty of a certain, a certain kind of error, uh, religious error, call it heresy, or call it Judaizing in the case of, 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 of crypto Jews, or it could be bigamy, or it could be uh, blasphemy in the case of what of, of regular Catholics. You have to remember, not everyone who was arrested by the Inquisition was, was a crypto Jew. And that, that's a big mistake uh, on the part of the, you know, that's just out there. Lots of Protestants too. So the, the Inquisitions understand this, but if they don't feel that they're getting more, out, it's enough of truth out of you, then they say, look, we, we can take you to the, to the, to the torture trade. In some cases, they'll even interrogate you in the torture the torture chamber to say, look, unless you come clean, this is what awaits you. In case one of the cases you, you, you've asked me about, Blanca uh, Mendez de Rivera, the, the woman in Mexico, she was in, she was kept in solitary confinement in the torture chamber. She was never tortured per se, but they just did it to kind of terrorize her. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. She spilled the beans. We'll get to that later. So in the sense, Torture is is, 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 is is a threat. They can apply torture if, if they still think if you if you if you give them more information, they still don't think you've done enough. They can actually torture you again. And there's a guy there writing it down. You and once you testify something, testify to something under torture, 
that you the you have to say it again without torture and say you sure what you said there is true so it's a, it's a very legalistic procedure much more legalistic than you think inquisitors are judge are, are lawyers canon lawyers for the most part they're very methodical they're not bloodthirsty individuals they're kind of career judges they don't necess- they're not necessarily any crueler than anybody else in 16th century 17th century europe they have a job to do and they and they do it some some do it more efficiently than the others uh, they're not all uh, they're not all without sin either if i can put it that way so the record is there there's the threat of torture the whole idea of the the defendant is to try to get out as, as much as to get away as, as much as they can in some pay, and, and in some cases they say no i did it i'm guilty and they and, and they will take whatever crime Whatever penance it's called, it's not punishment in terms of the Inquisition. Inquisition, it's a penance because what they do by by by, by undergoing a penance and there's various stages of it, light to heavy, can it, uh, and the heavy is could be being relaxed to the secular arm and being burnt in 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 in, in, in extreme cases. They want to rec- they want to cleanse the as a, from that perspective. They want to cleanse the community of sin it's a penitential ceremony so and it's you start with public shaming they, they have the out of the fe, the act of faith your crimes are read to you you're there they they give you they they dress you in a certain cloth in san benito and they and they, and they announce your penance and then you, and that penance then is car- carried out okay so before we get to this some of the specific stories you mentioned one already and some of these are are very interesting um Let's talk about autobiography. Uh, as you mentioned, many listeners, I'm sure, have read some sort of autobiography. There are endless amounts of autobiography, especially today. But when we think of autobiography today, is that what we mean when we talk about uh, autobiography in this time period, as you say? Not, not exactly, because we, today we think of, autobi- first of all, autobiography means the act of self-writing. The self is writing. That's the first thing we think about, and and, and it, we also think of this in the voluntary act. You 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 do so because you want to get get the record straight, your record straight. And there's also there's also a presumption that when you do so, you're telling the truth, and you're telling it's you're telling something about yourself. It's inner directed. You're telling you're telling the world aspects about aspects of your lives and feelings and and motivations that an ordinary biography would not be able to capture. So we think that we're getting deeper into the, in, 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 into the interior of the autobiography. The autobio, the autobiography. Now, early modern biography is a very different kind, it's a very different genre and kettle of fish. It, the models come out of Augustine's confessions uh, 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 of the, what is it, third century AD. There's during the Middle Ages, in the case of holy people, confessors, spiritual directors would ask a a, a mystic, a, a a nun who who's known for, for some extraordinary act. They say, "Well, tell us your story." These are what they what they call them spiritual autobiographies. The, the 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 individual is asked to tell them what has made them such a saintly person, or what why they could experience my, mystical mystical visions and the like. I guess the most, in the, in the English tradition, the most famous one is Marjorie Campe of the 14th century, or in the Spanish context of the 16th century would be Teresa of, Teresa, Teresa of Avila. They, they don't write them because they just feel like it. Somebody's telling them to write it. It's, it's, it's a quasi-voluntary act. It's, it's not totally coerced, but it's used for a particular purpose. These inquisitorial autobiographies are best conceived as what they are. It's involuntary. These people don't necessarily just say, here it is, because I want to do it. it, it, it there, there's a guy telling them to tell, tell them more about it because the, those judges have want to get certain kinds of information about the, these people. And they come, and that's what is the autobiography itself becomes or can come a can become can become dialogic now when the inquisition was first established 
in the 14, chapter 1478, the, the notion of what I have in the, these, these documents, I studied these discourses of the life, these whole autobiographies didn't, didn't exist. They, although the inquisitors, according to the manuals, want, wanted to get as much personal information out of the person, out of the individual they arrest as possible, it came out more or less in, 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 dialogue, in, 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 in the form of dialogue or was spontaneous on the part of some, let's say, poor uh, a Judaizing crypto Jew they arrested. He, he'd been he'd been practicing Hebrew rites for 12, 15 years, even though he had undergone baptism at some point. And then they said, "Well, I did it. I did it. I did. I practiced Passover. They called it. I I I I fasted on Fridays and Saturdays. I I I, I ate kosher meat. They, whatever the language they're using, different languages and the like. I I I, I practiced Judas rites. I, I'm guilty." And, and, and they will tell us, tell us more about it. They said, then they would ask them, who are you with? Where did you learn about this stuff? Who taught you? They're trying to find out as much about the nature of that community as possible because the job of the Inquisition, like it or not, was to, to, to cleanse that Catholic society, that Christian society, of what they perceived to be foreign elements. Religious beliefs they considered hostile to that of the Roman Catholic Church. So, to a certain degree, there's that kind of that confessional aspect of it. And only later, in the middle years of the 16th century, it was actually 51 a day, 1561, that they begin to regularize. They made it more bureaucratic, it becomes part of something that the Inquisition did on a regular basis. And from that moment to the to the early 19th century. Virtually maybe 50, 60 percent of all the cases that came before the that was called the Holy Office of the Inquisition, the Holy Office, but the individuals were asked to give them the discourse of their life. Tell them there was there's hundreds of small cases that the Inquisition dealt with, let's say cursing, minor blas a minor blasphemy. It, it wasn't worth their while. They didn't want to bother that, spend that much time. They wanted to get rid of that case as fast as possible, and they and they didn't bother with those. those ask the, the 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 defendants or the victims about their details about their lives. They kind of they just did it as if it was a parking a parking fine offense. But if they thought they were going to get something more out of that individual, or the the stakes were higher, that's when they have to go after that. They want that that biographical or autobiographical information. So uh, we mentioned earlier the Inquisition starts the Spanish Inquisition in 1478. But so these autobiographies don't become common though until the middle of the 16th century. Yes, there, are, there, there they, we have for the 1480s and 1490s a handful of of individuals who 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 come forward and tell their lives almost spontaneously. And one of them is in the book. This guy Luis de la Isla, who was born. Uh, what's his name? Abraham uh, Zaradiel. He's born in Fez. Uh, he, 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 um, he, 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 uh, he goes, to, he's in Spain. Uh, no, no, excuse me. I'm, I'm getting confused. I'm getting confused for the other guy. He's, bo he's born in Spain in the, in, uh, in, in the 1480s. Um, he, 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 he's raised as, as, as a Jew. In 1492, he's expelled with, with, with his parents. They go, to, they go to Italy. And around the age of 12, just before when the, he ought to have been bar mitzvah, he converts to Christianity. Why? This is from his own words. He's, he's, he, they haven't asked him. He said, this is what happened. And then I came back to Spain. And he, and, he, and he lives as a Christian. So supposedly lives as a Christian. And he stays there for another 10 or, 10 or so years. He's probably, we don't know, you can only read between the lines. Why? He says, I lived as a Christian, I did this, I, mean, I moved around, I'm meeting all these people, working as a silk worker. And then all of a sudden in 1506, he leaves the country, he leaves Spain, he goes to Italy, then he goes to Turkey. And all of a sudden he comes, he, he's, he, he, he reinvents himself as a, as a Jew. And it's interesting, and he goes around from, to, to Turkey, where, where the earthquake zone is now. He goes to Salonika, famous for its 
Jewish population since the Middle Ages, and which became a home for many for many Sephardim who had moved out of Spain in 1492 and took refuge in the Ottoman Empire. And it's interesting, he people who had been Christians and now living as Jews wore special kinds of dress. We need to know more about these special kinds of hoods they wore. They identified themselves as the kind of Jew they were by the by by their by their outward clothes. In any event. He goes around, he's, he's, in, he, he's in Syria, he goes to Palestine, and then he winds up in Alexandria, in Cairo, where all of a sudden, he said, well, he, he meets up with a lot of other Sephardim who had showed up there. And they say, well, you, are, you, are you one of us? He said, no, no, I'm going to live as a Christian. We don't know why, either because of his business practices. He, he did, he, he's moving back and forth. And, and he goes blind in Cairo. And the Jews there said, the reason you went blind is God is punishing you for, for living like a Christian instead of your inherited faith. He said, maybe true. He goes back to Spain, finds his way back. He goes to fly to Naples. He confesses to some Franciscan priests, I've sinned. I lived as a Jew, but I'm really a Christian at heart. He goes back to Toledo. This is some year, 1514. And he, and he, he and some one of his friends says you should go confess to the Inquisition, and 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 and, and you'll, you'll get off. And he goes, he gets before the judges, and he starts telling them that story that I just told you, and it's much more coherent in the book than I than I've just related it. And 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 he does it not because they asked them. He he wants he's trying to get them on their side. He's at, he's evoking trying to evoke their sympathy. He's this, he's this poor blind guy. Coming before them, he said, I've sinned. Let me off. And he, unfortunately, he's old and ailing and he dies in prison before the case is concluded. We've known about this case for about 150 years. It's interesting. Somebody had written about it in the, in the, in the 1880s. The documents had been published, but no one had done anything with it because they didn't know what to do with it. And then I thought it would make a great tale <laughs> to put in the book. And it's the lead-off story in the book. And, and his name... He, this, he uh, he become he, he took his Christian name is Luis de la Isla, Louis of the Island. Why I have no idea. Interesting. It's a really interesting story, and if for those interested in, in reading it, and as you mentioned, there's a bunch of so there's a bunch of them in here. I think there's seven now. Um, and as you mentioned before, the uh, Inquisition tried a heresy against the Catholic faith. So it could be Protestant, it could be witchcraft, blasphemy. It's not only Judaizing crypto Jews, but there are. Obviously, I, I assume mostly listeners are interested in crypto Judaism. We're talking about crypto Jews mainly, but there are others that you can mention. But uh, there's another one that's the one that's really interesting was about Francisco de San Antonio and Mariana de los Reyes. I think the, the, the wife, the one that comes from Fez, he's a Jew, yeah, he's from yeah, Fez, right. he went to Spain and back and forth. He's got a really interesting uh, story there. Right. He, I mean, just for the for the sake of everyone, the you. you Jews per se, I mean, that is to say, Jews who, who are Jews don't are not subject to the Inquis to this to the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. You you have to be have have been baptized and and and, and, sus been, and, and be suspected of practicing being what they call the judio tante crypto Judaism. That is to say, you had been, you had supposedly altered your faith, but you still practiced your ancestral faith. That's what they were after. And for, from, a, from 1478 till the 1530s, when they discovered Protestantism in Spain, what they called Lutheranism, the only individuals that were brought before the Inquisition were crypto Jews. No one else. It was in the 50, by the 1530s, they, they begin to spread their jurisdictions to Protestants and, and, and other deviant forms of Christianity that they found offensive. And by the middle of the year, Years of the 16th century, there's, there's, they're going after bigamy and blasphemy, and any anyone who's a baptized Christian who is involved in in some kind of what they deviant behavior can be arrested or subject to inquisitorial arrest. This there's crypto Jews all the way along right into the 18th century, but there's a variety of so-called crimes that they that they prosecute. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, the question, Luis de la Isla is a case in point. Uh, his name is Abraham Rubin. He's from Fez. You mean, he, not, not he, de la Isla. Like, right? Francisco de San Antonio. Yeah, San Antonio, right. He, he, 
he 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 travels throughout the Mediterranean as a kind of an itinerant rabbi. We don't know very much. This only comes from his what he tells the Inquisition later after his arrest in the 1620s. But for, he's traveling around for 15 years. He finally he goes to the Netherlands. Is it? At, at, if this is what he tells the Inquisition. He said, "Was there? I decided. I I just decided to become a Christian." And he converts. Why? We don't know. He's there for what? Then he goes to goes to Portugal and he starts acting like a rabbi again. He's, he, he starts around, he's got, he, he has books, Hebrew books. He's teaching Hebrew and he's performing ritual prayers and I, we don't know what else he's doing. And, and the Inquisition arrests him in Portugal. There's the Portuguese Inquisition separate than the Spanish, but he's let off. And for some reason, in 1621, he marries a young widow, who she says she's a widow. She may, she's probably not. Her husband ran off. She's much younger. She's half his age. He's a good-looking guy, about 40. And the two of them decide to go together to Madrid, to the capital of the Catholic monarchy. And they work out a scheme. They say, we, we're gonna, we want to be... I don't, it's not clear how they get the connections. We want to, we want to show you, we want to convert to Christianity, because we're both Jews, to in, in the royal chapel of the king. And they, they have this grand ceremony. Mariana, his wife, is a Catholic. She pretends to be a Jew. He's Jew, who is, we, he's converted back, he's gone back and forth. They said, well, he, they do they go through the ceremony. They have a public conversion. The king rewards the guy with some money. He comes back to Madrid and he goes off for a while. He comes back. And all of a sudden, in the 1620s, he's working again in Madrid as a secret rabbi, a clandestine rabbi. He, 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 he's catering to the interests and the, the, the spiritual needs of a, a group of Portuguese bankers. That had been brought to this to, to Spain, to Madrid by this by this by the Spanish monarchy, mainly for their money. And these were there's a large group of these uh, crypto crypto Jews uh, who came to Madrid in that particular period, mainly because Philip IV, that the monarch then was, they, they said, well, let's stop doing, let's stop worrying about these characters. We need their money anyway, and they're more than willing to to, to lend the money to the king. And then finally, somebody fingers this guy, uh, De La Isla, and they say, wait, wait a minute, what are you doing? And they, they arrest both him and Mariana, and that's what he, and then he, you go through this long, long trial, and where his, his rather chameleon-like existence has, is revealed, he, he tells about it, and in the end, uh, he is sentenced to five years in the galleys, which is a terrible, uh, a terrible sentence, and she's kind of just let off. But um, she pleads. She pleads the role. It's often a very common uh, plea for women. She said, "Well, I'm just an ignorant woman. I don't know anything. I don't know. I don't know anything about religion." He told me to do everything. It probably was a setup. Uh, they all organized it. But she gets off, and he get, he get, he he goes to the to the galleys, which is not a pleasant way to spend five years. If he survives, and we lose track. But his story of going back and forth, mobility. Meeting different groups, changing religions. He may be he, this guy. May Islam may be a con man, but that kind of instrumentalized religion. We saw it with Luis de la Isla already. It, it, it's it, 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 we have a feeling that in modern in modern times that our religious feelings is something that we carry with us. We internalize. And we carry through us indelibly throughout our lives. For many, but but that depends partly on your religious upbringing. But th these characters who are getting into trouble with the Inquisition, they don't have that deeply sense of deep sense of internalized religion. It's more. It, 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 I, I don't want to say it's skin deep, but they, they're willing to switch because they see advantages. It, it's instrumentalized. It's a tool that they can use. They can also change identities, and we see it with a guy called. Mr. Santos, right now in 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 Queens, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and so 
he, he is creating, I mean, the, the Inquisition would love a guy like George Santos because they say, well, what, what are you after? And why are you doing it? And so the Isla and, 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 and San Antonio are, are, are kind of, you know, they're avatars uh, <laughs> of Santos. And, and it's, it, it's difficult for us to understand them. But what, and what we know about it, all we know about them is what they tell the Inquisition. Whether it's the whole story, we have no idea. But, we, but if it was not for the Inquisition, oddly enough, these lives would be lost to us. And as strange as they may be, they're not necessarily typical. Without the, these records, we wouldn't be able to recover these lives. And how rich and interesting. We get fragments. We look at them. So we're in a sense, we're recovering aspects of the past, people of the past. These, what I called in the book, brief lives that to cite Foucault, that would otherwise be lost to historians because generally historians use written records and these poor people at the edges don't leave many records and we don't know very much about them. So it's from that point of view, from a historic, from a historical, uh, from a historian's perspective, it's an enormously rich source of information in which we, we, we can, we have a whole rainbow of individuals coming before us of di different times, different persuasions. And, and there's a woman in the book, a transgender woman, uh, woo, you know that she's gotten more play than you can ever imagine. Because everybody wants to know about that young woman and and and, and how she switched sexes every switch genders every uh, every two years. There, there's and a lot. Of, yeah, you can you can mention that. You can talk more about about whoever. And what's interesting is I just uh, you know before going on to other ones. About uh, San Antonio, it was my first one. So, like the, the book really is his first audience, his second audience, and then the wife. What's interesting about the wife is also, I think, I, mean, I think it says in the book that she was the one that she had gotten sick and she had confessed to a priest, and that's how they got in the whole mess to begin with about the story. But then, as it's point, I think you pointed out in the book um, how the, the Inquisition could be a trap for the unwary. How she, they knew this kind of that they did this kind of scam that she made believe she was a Jew, even though she was a Catholic, and they got the money for it. But then she, by mistake, and she's the one who admits that she had been married before, and suddenly right, no, no, that's, but that's by, but that's the purpose of the trial. That's what they're after. They want the, and that's why they want those discourses. They want to see what they can find, find the contradictions in the story, and they often come up. They, 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 they already know there's something wrong. They wouldn't have arrested them to begin with. They know that they're not ordinary types. And they're and all of them are pushing the envelope a little bit, and the, these are people kind of at the margins of groups, and 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 just and just because he, now five years later, there there would be a a, a a a new inquisitor general and a turn in the Spanish policies, and more crypto more of these Portuguese bankers would be brought crypto crypto Jewish Portuguese bankers were brought forward to trials in the 1630s and into the 40s, but this was a little moment. This is kind of a window of of, I don't want to say tolerance, but you know they, they just said, well, let, let these people be. We, we have to we have to deal with them one way or another. Uh, we need them. Uh, uh, but the, the Inquisition wasn't necessarily totally at, at at peace with that particular policy of the of the crown, because it's not a monolith. You have to also remember it's the Inquisition changes. It's not monolithic. It changes it changes policies with the inquisitors generals or with the council that runs it or with the monarch changing his or her priorities about the spiritual life of the kingdom. Okay, so now we can talk about some uh, others. So you mentioned already the Elena, 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 the, the, Elena, that Elena Sespin. This is this, well, we would call it, I didn't even have the language when I wrote it. And this is, she was the first, one of the first persons I discovered back in the 80s. Elena, Elena, uh, we think is, uh, born, uh, 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 she's, she's, she claims she's a hermaphrodite with both sexes. Although by the time that she, she, she's arrested, she's only female. She has no male parts left. She said, well, I'm a surgeon and they were rotting. Uh, I cut everything off. And they said, you did. <laughs> they don't quite believe her. But uh, uh, she, this was a, this Elaine, she, she's a malaha. She'd been married. She had given birth at some point. 
she she reinvents herself as a, a male in in teenage years. She she's a soldier. She becomes a surgeon in Madrid, and then lives in the outskirts of of of, of Madrid uh, as a surgeon, but marries a woman. So by 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 canon law, that's illegal, and she's. But in the end, someone says, "Wait a minute!" They recognize her from her soldier days. And says, That's not a man. I know her as a woman. <laughs> At some point, so they investigate, and they so they arrest her first by the secular judges. What's going on here? And then, and, and she said, "Well, I was arrested." And then she was in prison, and her 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 male anatomy. Uh, what she said was rotting. I cut it off. I'm a surgeon, and and all right. And then they, and then they just, they said, well, what is that? How can you do that? This is crazy. And the, and then inspect and they said, well, this is all. This is, she's only a female. And they said, well, maybe she'd used witchcraft. She's and this is and then and because of the suspicion that she's a sorcerer of some port, that's why they switch her from secular jurisdiction to the inquisitorial inquisition. And they go through her long and complicated case, and she tells them the stories of her lives. And in the end, they don't quite know what to do with Elena. Elena, uh, they they said, "Well, was the devil involved? Are you a you know are you a, are you a witch? What are you?" But as they they said, "Well, let's 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 put her to work. Her her penance is to work in a hospital in Toledo for two years because she's a, a trained surgeon." which she does. And all of a sudden, people from around the city and around the provinces started flocking to this hospital in Toledo to be cured by Elena. And the thought that if, if anybody can change themselves from a man into a woman, she must be doing something right. <laughs> and the lines are outside the hospital. And then the the, the Inquisition gets word of this, and so secular judges as well. And then, then they push her off to some hospital in a godforsaken part of Spain, another 50 in the middle of nowhere, and we lose sight of her. And it's an interesting, she becomes almost a, as a, some kind of a cult figure. Thanks to the Inquisition. It's odd. So she's an odd case, but Elena Elena has become the subject of more trans studies than you can ever imagine. And I don't follow that literature because it's, it, it, they're trying to make it as, as an exemplar of, uh, of Spanish attitudes in the 16th century. I think it's a one-off case, but how many Elenos, Elenas? There are more than, than we think, but that, she's quite unique. So, but this is, these are these kinds of little broken lives, these little stories that we'll be able to, to recover through these records. And that's their, from a historian's point of view, that's their value. Yeah, and even though that one doesn't have anything to do with uh, Judaizing, like I said, so that that's interesting. Nothing. There's there's Diego Diaz in here, Miguel the Pedrola. There's a bunch of other ones, but I want to jump one more that you had mentioned earlier. The one, the only other one, the other one that I want to mention is Donna Blanca Mendez de Rivera, who yes. um, the other yeah, she goes to Mexico, the New World. Well, she goes to Mexico, the New World, basically because she was she was a, a, a she is. She invents herself several times over, and she's a very interesting case. She she's she's in, living in Seville of, of of a Portuguese Jewish family. What's a Portuguese Jewish family living in Seville in the early 17th century? Now, many of the Portuguese, many Jews who left the kingdoms in 1492 emigrated to Portugal, and this is before Portugal had before Portugal expelled the Jews and made forced. Uh, forced the Jewish population there to, to uh, convert. That was in 1497. And then there was an inquisition there in 1532, 36, I can't remember the exact date. So there was a, 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 a large group of thousands of Sephardim left Spain. They went to neighboring Portugal. They didn't integrate as, as well as they did in Spain. So when the inquisition comes along, they're, they're starting to get in trouble in, in, in Portugal in the 1540s. And in 1580, after Philip II annexes, the Spanish king annexes Portugal, there's a war and all of that. Believe it or not, a lot of these Portuguese Jews come return to Spain. You would think, why would they go back to Spain? There's the Inquisition there. 
the Inquisition had other things to do. And, and, they, and it's a bigger place. And they can meld into the population. And she, she's there. She says, oh, I'm, I, she said, I was raised Catholic. But then she, she apparently, was, when she was a teenager, she said, well, I learned something about Judaism from my, from my, from my, from, from my aunt, or I think my, my cousin. And the next thing we know, she may have gotten into trouble. She emigrates to Mexico. And Portuguese Jews and these conversos had the right to go to the Americas, starting in the, in, in the early 17th century. And they fan out all over the place, south, south to Lima, and to Cartagena, and, and, and above all, to, to Mexico. And there's a large group of, 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 of conversos of Portuguese extraction of different walks of life, living in Mexico and the, the silver mining towns of northern Mexico, and but it's 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 it, it's a community that numbers in the hundreds, if not thousands. But there's no rabbis. Officially, there's no rabbis. And here's the interesting thing about the, the, the these conversos in the Americas: the, the, there's new there's new rituals and ceremonies that are developed. And in theory, uh, a, a woman in 17th century Judaism could not work as a rabbi. But if you don't have any rabbis, and you got somebody who knows something about prayers, and knows how to kosher, uh, or can tell you how to kosher a lamb, or, 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 or a cow, and knows certain prayers, she, in a sense, works as a which she calls a sem the, the Inquisition calls it a semi rabbi or a crypto rabbi. She serves that population. And the next thing we know, boom, she and her three daughters are arrested by the Inquisition. And, and she's in prison a long time. And, 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 they, and, and after a while, after she tells this story how I've emigrated, what I've been doing, and she begins to do what exactly the Inquisition wanted her to do. Name names. And she starts telling the names of all of her accomplices, what she did. She tells them about the rituals she was performing, how she did it, what prayers she was saying. This is not the first time it happened, but she, she in a sense, she spills the beans. And, and, and actually the information she provided to the, to the Inquisition in the late 1530s set the stage for many larger auto de fe's in the, 15, in the 1540s, uh, excuse me, 1640s, went for a number of reasons having to do with Portugal, the, the revolt of Portugal from uh, Spain. Uh, the, the, those Portuguese Jews in the New World were, were thought about as a fifth column, uh, something they, they might work against us. And there was kind of the, the great conspiracy and many of those Portuguese who having enjoyed de facto, uh, de, de facto tolerance for 30, 40 years, were, re were arrested by the Holy Office in, in New Mexico. But, and, and, and that, that you think for what she did, she would be, be relaxed of the secular arms. We don't know why. They just sent her back to Seville. Well, and what happens then? She doesn't get arrested again. And she some, kind of, somehow blends into the population. So in a sense, you have stories of integration and separation, rediscovery of faith, Renouncement of faith—it's part of that non—that that part of that instru, instru, instrumentalized religion that that I spoke spoke about earlier. And once again, it goes against contemporary notions of what these people in the 15th and 16th or 17th century were. There's how do I put it? Uh, they're shopping around for different ways to be saved. They all interested in salvation. And and, and 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 there are people who say, well, you, you know, you, you can be saved in many things. I'll try this. I'll try that. Their lives are often miserable. They don't have enough of, to, to eat, or they have sicknesses and plagues of various kinds. They shop around. You know, they 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 whatever works works. And she's interesting because she's part of many of those conversos in the Americas. Practice what a very famous scholar, uh, anthropologist, Natan Bastel, called theological bricolage. That is to say, they mix and match. They take elements of Christianity and, and, and fold it into, the, in, into, into Jewish practice. They, 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 they read the prohibited books of Esdras. Nobody reads it. You shouldn't read the book of Esdras. 
the biblical that b- biblical text. They 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 have they have ritual flip flogging of crucifixes, and it, and we oh, thought some people years ago thought it was a, a myth invented by the Inquisition. But the more cases we discover, no, it was it's either an inversion of the kind of of um, uh, 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 flagellant sex they saw on the streets, or it's a way and say of rejecting the the faith of of the dominant religion, and they're kind of using what Christians do, but the, to the opposite. Uh, Opposite effect. There was a little. She told uh, men, um, uh, Blanca tells the Inquisition, but whenever a Christian procession came by, I shut my eyes and I turned my back. You know, in the sense, of these are ways to reject it. They they're borrowing, they're inverting, they're changing, they're creating a kind of a uh, uh, what that word bricolage in the sense of with good French term for a kind of a, a composite religion. That bar that that's borrowed, invented, but it works for them, for time. And and sometimes they have to go to prison for. It. So these stories, do you view them as indicative of life at the time? Do you view them as outliers, or are they almost neither? They're just selected stories of some lives that we have. Yeah, how you know? The, it, there's a famous guy, Minocchio, that was the, 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 a famous miller and. In, in northern northern Italy in the 16th century, who said that it's called the cheese and the worms. And the, he said, in the beginning, the, the the moon was made of cheese, and then came the worms and made it the same. Well, how many Minocchios are there? We don't know. And the same thing, how many Blancas are there? We only know who shows up in these records. These are people who are living at at, at, at edges, I think. They're pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable behavior. So there's more of them than we think, but they're not necessarily normative. They're not necessarily normative. And they they only surface when they get arrested. And, and we only get that glimpse, that broken line, thanks to these records. I mean, it's tragic to think about it, that they are being arrested for, for, for deviancy. It's not unknown. This country arrests, arrests a lot of people for, for deviance, and other countries do so as well. When you push the boundaries, social boundaries, or you push religious boundaries in certain countries, you will you, you're subject to some kind of punishment or penance or exile. So the, the, yes, it's part of the, it's integral to society. They're not the movers and shakers necessarily. But the, they're, they're part of what that the past is, and 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 thanks to these records, we can recover those experiences. Uh, and, and in the sense where we you get a much more richer and fuller and and broader and deeper understanding of the types, the ordinary, ordinary men and women who who comprise these societies and how they live. And so, if it, it's a it's a gold mine, it's a tr- it's a treasure house of information, and it's no wonder that l- many of these cases. Younger st- scholars are burrowing into these cases, digging them up, writing books about them, because they're, it, 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 some of them are quite fascinating. We want to know more about them as much as you can. There's some great new books about, about the, not necessarily all crypto Jews. They could be Muslims. They could be witches. They're, they're all different types. And the, 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 the Inquisition has become some, it's being used now as a huge database. And many of the cases have been digitized. The one you mentioned, Elena, Elena, the, we've talked about the transgender woman. Her case is online and, and on, on the side of the Spanish archives. You can go in there and you can, if you could read the, you have to learn how to read the paleography, which is not easy. But you, it's there for, for, for a graduate student, anybody who wants to do it. And, and gradually they're going to put all of these cases on, online. So in a sense, all of those so-called secret proceedings of the Inquisition hundreds of years later, of becoming public. Yeah, and that's why the book is really interesting to read, to read more of these cases. Um, and I don't think I mentioned there's an introduction in the book, and then each case, there's like a little, uh, I think each one has like a little introduction, and then there's like a postscript afterwards, and then you have like a little further reading on each chapter. But how did you go about picking and choosing which stories to portray and to mm-hmm. relate in this book? Yeah, well, <laughs> well the first one I said, First one was Elena Elena, because I thought 
I was giving talks on Elena and later back in the in, in the in the 1980s. Said, this is crazy. I you know this is new to me, and and it was so so fascinating. But then, as I said, as I was teaching the, the, my course on the history of the Inquisition, medieval and then Ma, the Spanish one, I said I need I wanted more pri primary sources, and I and and I started one doing some work of my own. And then I, I and then I met Abby, who was working in the archives. I spoke to my colleague David Nirenberg, who was who was who was working on 15th century uh, Judaism in, in in Spain. He said, "Well, read this case about Isla that he was published umpteen years ago." And then I spoke to an art historian. Uh, he said, "Oh, I think there was a case of this Protestant who who got into trouble with the Inquisition that was published 40 years ago. <laughs> These cases had been lost." So, I, in a sense, I, I, I and I remember going to the archives of the Inquisition in Madrid. And reading through some of the records, and I found the Muslim, Diego de Deza. I knew about Piedrola, the prophet, from my book on Lucretia de Leon, the prophetess. And I had read that case. And I said, well, I wanted, I wanted a series of cases that were indicative of the, of the, the broader jurisdiction of the Inquisition. Crypto-Jews, prophets, people got into trouble for prophecy, transgender sexual types who pushed, the, pushed that particular... So, so social envelope, a, a Morisco, that is to say, an heir, a, the heir of a converted Muslim who, who was practicing se secret Muslim Islam in, in a little town in Spain and went off to North Africa and then, and then came back and, and then a, a Protestant. And so in a sense, I said I wanted that whole range. But I, I stuck to the 16th and 17th century. I, I, chronologically, you could, if you, now there's a, there's a young man in Madrid, actually I'm going to, to be on his doctoral tribunal in two weeks. He's read every single one of these autobiographies. He's counted the number of words that they have, their language, he's examined the language. I mean, it's a huge thing. It's almost impossible to read. And we have, and then he's got three case studies at the end, which I think are the best part. But he's gone through the rhetoric. He knows who they said. He, he's analyzed every single one, every percentage. And we know the interesting thing is we've learned that it's these these uh, these inquisitorial um, autobiographies are unique to the Spanish Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, the Neapolitan Inquisition, the Venetian Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition. Never asked for that information. So why Spain? And that's an interesting question. We don't have. A, Total answer, but it's, it goes back to the Jewish issue we raised before, that heresy is in the blood. That perception, that, that, that the importance of genealogy in all of this. And starting in the 15th century, a kind of concern in Spain, starting in the 15th century, owing to large numbers of individuals of Jewish background who converted, sometimes under duress, sometimes voluntarily, to Judaism, to, excuse me, to Christianity, becoming what they were called new Christians, there was the tension between this new social group that was neither fish nor fowls got between the stuck between the old Jews, the traditional Jews, and the, and the Catholics, and therefore that genealogy: who are you? What are you? What's your origins? That became a concern in Spain. We know about it popularly, popularly through the through the so-called purity of blood statutes, and in the sense that genealogical issue, and it's it's not biological racism is is the way that. We think of it in the 19th century, but there's something in your past that you're. It's in your. This, the Spanish term was rata. It's in your blood. It's there. We want to discover it. And so, but this is speculation on our part. We don't really have the answer. But that's that. That's the closest for the moment we're going to get to it. But it is Spanish exceptionalism, and that it's the in, exceptionalism of Spain's Inquisition, because the other Inquisitions don't do it. This is not to say that they didn't ask for personal detail. But they didn't come out in the course of trials, but it's not institutionalized in, in the in the official instructions of the institution. Uh, very interesting. So I'm going to link uh, in the show's notes to the book. Anyone interested can purchase the book. Do you have any other suggested reading about such similar type of autobiography or these type of thing or any just inquisition kind of uh, topics for listeners? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> there, there, there's so many books on the, the this book I there 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 are some big books. This one I would just refer to by uh, uh, yes, read Garcia Arenal's a Sam, the, the Samuel, life of Samuel Palacci, life of three worlds. He's this 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 Jew from Fez who 
who emigrates to Spain and he, and he's he's what they call a court Jew. My, he trades with the Netherlands, goes back to Spain, goes. He, he becomes a kind of an arms dealer and he becomes a spy. It, it, her name is it's in English G A R C I A dash R A R E N A L Mercedes Garcia Arinal. She's it, 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 it's it's a wonderful book, and and it and it, and it bring it, and it's one life, but it uses once again these inquisitorial sources, and she has a more recent book of, of a guy called Jeronimo de Rojas, who's a Morisco, that is to say, a converted Muslim, and it's a big fat book published by Brill. <laughs> it's too big for easy reading, but if you want to go through the whole trial, and, and, and she publishes all the records, and it's all she translates it. It's in English. It is. It, it, it's a magnificent work of scholarship. For if you're interested in in in, in witches, and uh, uh, there's there's a new book by a woman by the name of Luann Holmesa, H O M Z A, on on ch on children who were who testified before the Inquisition. The Inquisition was not very much interested in witches, much like, unlike the guys in Salem or in England. They said it's a lot of hooey. They didn't. They they said this is this is this is this this doesn't add up. There were there was some witch cases up by the French border, but there was no witch craze as in Spain as there was in England or France. Uh, and but but her 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 book just published last year. Uh, a number of these trials. It, 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 once again, it's a great little read. Or read Sally Nall N A L N A L N A L L E Mad for God. And one of these other prophet types <laughs> in 16th century who shows up and he starts preaching on his own. He says, How can you do that? You know, you, <laughs> you have no, you're not a, you're not a clergyman. But I, you know, yeah, he, 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 he's a little on edge, but you know, it's a, like some of the guys we see in the streets preaching. They would arrest them. What are you doing? So, in a sense, there's a, there's a whole variety of these studies. That are that are that are out there, and, and I promise there are more in the work. So many that I've lost. I, I haven't really worked in a lot of this material for years, but it's it, it's like a little factory, a fascinating factory, because it's enriching our no knowledge of what the Inquisition did, how they did it, kind of getting rid of a lot of the old stereotypes of these characters being bloodthirsty monsters who are out for blood. Uh, that was the 19th century view of it. This is the view that my guy Henry Charles Lee had, and then he said, "No, no, it's more about bureaucratic. Let's change it. Let's see how it works. Let's understand it." And then you have, and then then you say, "What is it about a society that would arrest people for for, for being members of for being re religiously deviant or socially deviant?" And so, in a sense, we 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 begin by thanks to these records, we're learning more about that society. We also understand that society was far from unique in in in, in expunging elements it considered to be exotic or or or, or, or dissident, either politically or, or religious. Virtually every modern early modern society, Protestant, Protestant, and Catholic, uh, acted in a similar way. And Henry Charles Lee, you mentioned that so you're writing a biography of it. I've just finished it. It's out for review as I speak. Called, but it's, not, it's called the the working title is the the Inqui the Inquisition's Inquisitor. Philadelphia's Henry Charles Lee, and he was a pub he was a very important publisher. He uh, here in Philadelphia, a very wealthy publisher. He, he had the he, he we had the largest medical uh, publishing country uh, publishing firm in the nation. He had the monopoly on Gray's Anatomy for a hundred years. Uh, bought a lot of real estate in downtown. Uh, downtown Philadelphia. He had co uh, coal mines and oil up in Pottsville in central P Pennsylvania, thanks to his father. And he was Quaker on one side, Catholic on the other, and he he he, he didn't like religious intolerance. He, he wanted tolerance. He was a great liberal, 19th century liberal. And he, he got interested in how, did, why do people, why are they punished? Why are people being punished for reasons of faith? And he wrote the first great books on the medieval Inquisition in the 1880s. And then he wrote other books, another four volumes on the, on the Inquisition of Spain in the early, early 20th century. And it's the, it still is the foundational text for, for all Inquisitions, all studies 
of both the medieval and, and, the, and the Spanish Inquisition. It's a bit ponderous to read. Four or five, you know, 2,000 pages. You, you can't, you, only, only, a, only a mad professor would assign it to their graduate students. <laughs> but it's there on the shelves and, and for, for those of us who have to deal with it, the text. <laughs> So and it, but so you said it's out for you your book, but it's not being published yet. No, well, I'm waiting for the you know when you when you subject when you send it out for, to a it's an academic book. Yeah, I mean Henry Charles Lee is not going to it's not Hillary Clinton. You, nobody's going to buy this book except a few scholars and a few people here in Philadelphia. Um, uh, you, you when you when you send it to an, a, 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 a university press, first the, the the editor has a look at it and said, well, do we like this? Does it fit our list? At that point, the editor decides, let's send it out for external review. So you get a, you get two or three people who 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 who, who know, supposedly know something about the subject, and then they give the report. And 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 once and then once you have those reports, the editor then takes it to the to the editorial committee, and they said, well, let's publish it. And then the whole process of 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 pushing the book forward. Uh, 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 um, uh, proceeds and it, and and and, it, and it, it's a good way because it gets rid of some of the the you get rid of some of the errors that always creep into books. Uh, po popular publishing, commercial publishing, they don't necessarily have those outside reviewers, and that's why you can get a lot of strange books filled with errors and mistakes. Right. And okay. I'm not saying that everyone every error is ever going to be eliminated, but uh, it, at least it. it it, 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 in the end, it produces a better product, even though it may be for a limited readership. Okay. So, well, hope let's hope Henry Charles Lee hits the show, the Inquisitor's Inquisition, uh, and it, and it tells you how he wrote the book and why he wrote the book and and and, and how the, what we're discussing today. Why a hundred years ago they focused on torture and the Inquisitors, and, and it was the Protestant view of the Inquisition before it was the the, the, the Jewish view of the Inquisition. And it was it was it was it was, it was you know, they they focused on torture and you can think of Mel Brooks' History of the World Part Two where they had sign that scene in the in, in the dungeons of the Inquisition that was what that was the 19th century view of the Inquisition that was we, we've changed our view we're looking at it from the bottoms up looking at the actual cases trying to find out more about the people we care less about the Inquisition and we want to know these. The stories of the ordinary men and women, Jewish, Muslim, Jewish converts, uh, Jewish extraction, Muslim extraction, whoever, and, and to learn more about the society, how they thought, how they prayed, how they ate, what they ate. They're, and you can, you, they're actually people, there are some books have come out on the crypto Jews on dietary cookbooks, because uh, on, 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 they asked them what they were eating and how they prepared it on Saturday, on Friday night and Saturday. This is back in the 1480s. So there's there's so much in these records. So as as a, as a, as, a, as abhorrent as that institution was, and we should never forget that, it is a great source of information for restructing all kinds of lives, brief, though interesting. Absolutely. So I'll link to all uh, the books that you recommended, as well as uh, this book, Inquisitorial Inquiries. That's very interesting, as we discussed. And uh, listeners interested in learning more about it can check it out. If you have any more questions, come back and I can give you more. I mean, you, I mean oh, I'm getting old, you see. <laughs> um, I can get, if you want more titles, I can get you a lot more. I mean, Great. It, but but just give, shoot me a line and I'll be happy to do that. Sounds so this good. This has been fun. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor Kagan. Richard.